you'll see every major lie throughout history that actually had legs, that actually stuck around for a while, had to have a certain element of truth in it. One of the biggest, if not the biggest lie in history is the whole concept of Christianity. Christianity, anyone that actually investigates it, doesn't need to have an IQ of 300 to realize it's fake man-made religion. I'm not saying this because I'm Jewish. I'm saying it because I investigated it. And anyone that investigated it themselves, investigated the sources of where it came from, what it actually said, what actually happened, who's against who, compared their own documents against themselves, easily arrives at the same conclusion. But how is it that over two billion people are practicing Christianity without a second thought? Whether they're Catholics or one of the many denominations of Christianity, how is it possible that so many are following this giant lie where they say that some fool died 2,000 years ago and somehow that makes him God? In reality, if you look at the historical documents, we know that the only source, the only document that actually spoke of him, if it's the same person, Bechlal, at the time he was even alive, was the Torah, was the Gemara. The oral Torah. Other than that, no other document ever discussed Jesus. No newspaper discussed him. No journalist discussed him. No book ever talked about him. Nothing. Now, if somebody thinks somebody is a Mashiach or a God or anything, even if he's just a popular baseball player, somebody writes about him. A little kid draws him or something. In kindergarten, they make a something. Nothing. No document was ever written about him for 300 years after he died. Meaning that all of the people that wrote the document never knew him. He was dead already. But yet, billions of people came and left this world believing that this is true. Reason? The foundation is true. The foundation of Christianity is true. What's the foundation? The foundation is it comes from the Torah. They say that the New Testament is two books. It's the Old Testament, a.k.a. Torah, with an addition. So yes, we all know that the Torah is true. They say it's also true. They just say there's an addition. We say there wasn't an addition. The Torah was written once, that's it, the end. So, the fact that the larger part of the New Testament, meaning the Torah has about 304,800 letters, in comparison to the New Testament of approximately 100,000. So you see that out of 400,000, 75% is true. Who's going to check the other 25%? Who's going to check even after you see the first parasha is true? You see that... Shem created the world. You don't need to be a genius to believe that. Muslims, Jews, Christians, all believe that God created the world. So, everybody agrees. Therefore, see, we all have the same thing. So no one is going to care enough to investigate. Unless they really want to know. Unless they really want to connect to the real God. And not just to connect to some culture or some uh, type of belief system that allows them to continue behaving the way they are without changing. They don't want to change. They don't want some, a belief system that helps them change. They want something that confirms their existing behavior. And this is exactly what's happening today with many people, Jews or Gentiles, where when you tell them the truth and you tell them words of Musar, you tell them that Hashem expects more from them, they fight you, like you wrote it. The rabbi never told me this. Why you say, so maybe you're wrong. Well, we'll compare. We'll compare his sources versus mine. My source is the Torah. I don't know what sources he uses, because there's no source for what he says. So now, when people hear some of this stuff, and they're not really looking for the truth, what are they looking for? They're looking for things that are more convenient to hear because they justify their existing behavior. 
I'm comfortable doing this, I'm comfortable doing that. People like that, unfortunately, you can't help. You can't help somebody who doesn't want to help themselves. But the good news is that even though sometimes we don't want to help ourselves, our Jewish neshama yearns for more. Our Jewish neshama is not willing to give up. Our Jewish neshama is going to say, okay, maybe you don't want to change. But I know what's going on up there. I'm going to force you to change. I'm going to start begging Hashem to force you to change. Every night that we go to sleep, a large part of our neshama goes upstairs. This is why we say, Modeani, that you brought back my soul. Every day we wake up in the morning, we say, thank you Hashem for bringing back my soul. Why, where did it go? It went upstairs. What did it do upstairs? What did it do in heaven? It told the Bedin of Shamaim, what did you do today? Oh, I stole a little bit today, not a lot. Yesterday I stole more. Oh, I uh, cursed today. Yesterday I cursed less. Oh, I did this. You tell them all the good and bad things you did. So the Neshama says, when I go up there, I'm going to tell on you. And I'm going to ask them to force you to fix yourself. Because I know what happens if you don't. So when you get Tikkunim, you get different tests in your life, whether it's a flat tire or Chas V'Shalom more, it's not because it's bad for you. It's good for you. It's trying to fix you. Hashem is trying to talk to you. And since you're not Moshe Rabbeinu, He's not going to talk to you out of a burning uh, bush. He's going to talk to you through Tikkunim. He's going to give you a flat tire. So you look upstairs and say, Hashem, you're right. I just don't know why. Oh, maybe he's trying to save me from a car accident. Or maybe the customer I'm about to meet was going to cheat me. Or maybe the house I was supposed to buy really has a rotten foundation. I don't know anything about houses. I wouldn't know if it has a rotten foundation or not. So I'm, not, I'm going to miss the appointment. Somebody else is going to come in, offer even more money, and the guy is not going to consider me even part of the equation. He's going to sell the house. I'm going to feel bad about it. But in reality, Hashem is saving me. And there's countless reasons that Hashem puts into his accounting of why he does every single thing he does to you. But sometimes those things hurt. If you connect to him and you're willing to improve yourself, it becomes easier to understand why. Easier to understand why is he doing those things. Because there's no way that he brought you into this world to suffer. If you want you to suffer, just leave you in Gainom. It's much better built over there for, for suffering. He didn't bring you here to suffer brought you here to work. The problem is that we don't want to work. We think that we came here for a vacation. So Hashem has to remind us once in a while. 